When I got married, a friend asked me the day before, how did you know that Elizabeth, my wife, was the one? And that was what I said. I said, I'm so happy doing absolutely nothing with this woman. I mean, I have so many friends who have gone through these relationships where it was all reliant on doing the fun stuff, yeah. on doing the trips, on doing the fancy dinners out, on doing the events and the cool photos and all that stuff. And as soon as you got them into a setting where there was none of that, the relationship fell apart. The biggest problem is that men and women are not same. You may win the argument, but if you lose the friend, was it really worth it? Your mentor is Tim Cook. Was or is or I don't know. So was you were you in his team? What was how was it? No, I have a very funny story of how Tim and I met. Um, so flash back to 2014. I just started my first job out of college. So I played okay. baseball at Stanford University in California. I just took a job working in finance and You're investing. You're from Stanford. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was very lucky to get in. I don't know how they let me into school mm -hmm. there. And I took my first job. And my job was going to be working 80 to 90, 100 hours a week. Really, really tough first job. I was going to work really hard. And so I knew if I wanted to continue my fitness, mm -hmm. I was going to have to go to the gym early in the morning. And what that meant was that I had to show up at the gym at 4.45 okay. every oh. single morning. Okay. Because I wanted to get to the office by 6.30, so I'd work out 4.45 to 6 and then go to the go to the office. So I get to the gym near my office, and there's five people that show up every single day at, at that same time. Only okay. five people. And so, you know, you're in the gym with the same people every single day, so you chat with them and you get yeah. to know them. After about six months of chatting with the same group of people, I talked to this one man and uh, someone came over to me after and said, do you know who that is? I said, no, I don't. He said, that's Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple. And I just said, oh, shit. Because I had no idea who he was for six months and I'd been talking to him probably sounding like an idiot. And only on that day did I discover that this was the CEO of one of the biggest companies in the world. Damn. So after that, I was chatting with him the next time. I talked about this article that I had read about him in and I guessed his email address later in the day and sent it to him. I said, this was the article that I mentioned to you. He responded and was very kind. And so I just thought, I always have this phrase, closed mouths don't get fed. If you don't ask, you will never get. Hmm. And so I figured why not be bold? So I replied to him and said, I would love to pick your brain. I'd love to learn from you. I don't want a job. I'm not looking for anything, but I would love to learn from you and your career experience. Will you get a coffee with me? And he said, yes. And it started what has become an incredible mentor relationship for me in my life. I've never worked with him. I don't think I could because I imagine he's a tough boss, but he's been an amazing influence in my life. And he's been someone who has supported me enormously in what I do today and helped me think through these changes that I've made in my life from working in finance to working as a, you know, kind of entrepreneur and creator um, and just been an incredible relationship that came out of a purely lucky circumstance of the fact that I happened to be at the gym at the same time as this person. Mm, damn. Okay, I have more questions to it, but first I want to say, guys, start going to the gym at 4.45. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is not necessarily the lesson, but what it is the lesson to that is this idea of luck surface area where you can create luck. Yeah. Luck is not all lucky. I expanded my luck surface area by doing something like that because the type of people that show up to the gym at 445 are generally high performing disciplined people. And the the other people out of the five, it was like the founder of one of the biggest investment funds in the world. I mean, it was a very high performing group that I happened to then connect with because True. I was there. Interesting, because yeah, like why would a normal person wake up at 4 a.m. and go to the gym? Like it's just... You have to be a psychopath. <laughs> 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 and I'm a night owl. Now, please, like I just hope that some other founder, they work out at like 9 p.m. <laughs> well, I think founders tend to go in one of two ways, right? There's either the crazy morning people like Tim is, or there's the night owls yeah. that are up working until three, four in the morning like you. So I'm sure you're not going to be out of luck. You'll, you'll find someone. <laughs> but yeah, and you know, I also feel I, the luck surface area, I feel luck is created. 
I mean, obviously there is one part which is which is given, mm. but you can definitely create your luck by doing little things things like this. That you you can be at the right place with the right people, or you can surround yourself in the right city, or I don't know, just just like there are so many different combinations which you can make in order to just create your luck mm-hmm. and be there at the right time. There are four types of luck. Okay. The first type is blind luck. That's what you reference. The things you're just given. God, mm-hmm. where you're born, who you're born to, the circumstances of your life. You cannot control them. Blind luck. Okay. The second type is luck from motion. That's when you're going around hustling when you're young and you're creating connections, meeting people. You just create so many collisions that luck might strike as a result of that. The third type is luck from awareness, which means you get so good at spotting opportunities for luck because you're so knowledgeable about a given space that you can see luck coming from a mile away. And the fourth type is luck from uniqueness, which is your hobbies, your interests, that you have so much deep knowledge on, you become the expert that everyone is seeking out for specific types of opportunities. So the type of person who has been a nerd about artificial intelligence for the last 10 years is now being sought out by all these companies that are building in the space. And that's lucky, but not really. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. I think there's a fifth kind of luck, which is combination of all four. Mm. That is what worked for me till Mm. now. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's Not, the best kind I that's think. the best kind like I, I i really feel that i was blessed to be born in a family where my parents just supported me mm. through my throughout my career they never asked me to do anything apart from things which i love that is one the second is i really hustled my way out i went out everywhere and i'm a big believer of networking and creating your own luck by being at the right place the right thing doing right thing stuff right like that's the second and what was the third one i forgot the name awareness you're spotting oh. luck now now you're seeing it yeah you are doing that for yeah. sure now oh awareness like okay i want to so podcasting for me was the awareness luck i knew that if i can pick brains of the best people in the country it not only gives me an opportunity to learn from them mm. it gives me an opportunity to be in the same room with them and that itself is going to give me so much opportunity and so much luck like i mean if you are sitting with the top 100 startup founders in the country and in a year you're hanging out with them there is some kind of luck which you're creating mm. so that's the awareness luck and then the fourth is because i was i was speaking and i was learning communication since last 10 years probably this is working out for me and now everybody is coming and talking to us so all four together is the fifth kind well you followed the path because that's how these four types of luck tend to play out where you're born you can't control when you're young it's mostly blind luck but then as you start to grow in your life and in your career you start the motion you start creating motion as you did you were hustling creating that energy then you go to the next stage and you start being aware of all of the opportunities that are there that's only once you've developed that knowledge yeah. and experience and then the uniqueness is the same because it just takes years and you're just getting started on all of those by the way you've just started to scratch the surface of feeling that luck you're 26 years old yeah You got excited. a lot of luck left. <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited I, for you. I, I'm 32 and I feel like the old one in the room. All the good gods in the in the world, please please give me yeah. all the love. Well, you <laughs> will the benefit mm. for all of us is you will give back a lot yeah. along the way of having that lucky set of circumstances. A lot of people get lucky and they just take it all for themselves. They bring it inside. They're not creating value in exchange. And that's a shame. you're going to create a lot of value for other people to help them yeah. on their curve yeah by putting out this content i think you know the way you brought up and the way your career trajectory has been it also defines the what what kind of person you're going to become so i feel i am wherever i am because few people helped me okay and that's why i feel it's my responsibility to help others right because I wouldn't be here if some person wouldn't have taken a chance on me and given me some opportunity. Mm. Like it was just I mean I'm so grateful whether because when I started let's say just talk about podcasting forget the world. When I started podcasting my podcast was so small there was nobody like I had like 50,000 followers something like that on YouTube and I started a podcast video podcasting and I reached out to people and someone who doesn't go to a podcast Uh, under million followers he said yes mm. and then the next person said yes and the next person and then recently 
we are getting people who are saying no to Forbes and Times and they're saying yes to us and I'm like you know so they are helping yes. us so it's become like responsibility that I need to help others mm. so it helping and giving back it depends a lot on how your career has been shaped mm. so that just Sir Isaac Newton once said if I have seen further it was because I stood on the shoulders of giants and that's how you feel that's certainly how I feel that we have been able to achieve certain things because we stood on the shoulders of some giant who was willing to put us on their shoulders and as yeah. a result your responsibility your duty is to be that giant for others for others in the future wow and that's the greatest calling in life is to be able to do that for other people now to give it back damn that's so it's such a simple idea but it's so powerful i really liked it i want to be a shoulder <laughs> It's the great Brothers it's the greatest out. joy you can have is when someone in a few years says this about you on a podcast. Mm -hmm. The exact thing you just said about those other people. You're going to be listening to someone that you mentored and they're going to say this about you. Wow. They're going to say I'm only here because Raj helped me. Yeah. What an amazing feeling. What what better value could you create? And there's no money to that. They might not pay you for that. True. But unbelievable sense of fulfillment. Oh, comes from that. it does it does i just want to take the name of the guy because he said it because i really feel that he should or uh, he should find this out nikhil kamath have you heard of him he runs uh, one of the biggest startups in the country mm. zeroda it's oh, bootstrapped yeah. mm. you know the story right yes. bootstrapped two brothers so nikhil helped me out in the beginning he said mm. yes when i was like nobody knew me mm. back then and then he not only just came on my podcast built a relation with me okay we did an audio one and then an I shamelessly asked him again I was like hey you know what the audio doesn't cut out for me do you want to do a video and he was kind enough to call me at his place we did it and then he connected me five other people as well right who does that he's he's a goddamn billionaire like he doesn't have time for people like me but he helped me at that time and just just a kind soul I feel the exact same way Tim is one of those people for me that have helped me when they had absolutely no reason to do that they've believed in me when they had no reason to believe in me at the time and there have been a few people in my life who have done that who have believed in me when there was absolutely no reason to and i've never let a single one of them down and i don't intend to start hmm of course you should not and you will not mm. you 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 also getting started what are you saying yeah. <laughs> i'm i'm the old man in the room next to you i'm excited by the next i mean i'm i think i'm 6 years older than you and i'm so excited about what the next 6 years of your life looks like cuz i think about my years from 26 to 32 and you're just if you're 26 you are just starting to feel the compounding that occurs in your career Okay. You were just starting to see those networks start to connect and the circles starting to connect and the knowledge starting to compound. It's the most amazing time. Like this next 15 years is just unbelievable. Wow. If this is the start, damn, I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is I'm getting goosebumps right yeah. now because I can't. I'm excited. <laughs> I I get it, it gives I don't me want, chills. I, I don't even want to play like all humble and stuff because I fucking can play to yeah. do this, right? <laughs> I'm excited. Okay. Going back to the Tim Cook part. Yeah. What do you first is what do you think why do you think he accepted to your thing like why do you think he believed in you at that time this is very important for all the young people mm -hmm. who are watching this because i want them to know that there must be some skill which you must have had there must be something in you like I, apart from the fact that you you're from stanford and you look sure uh, you were in the gym every time i think uh, the first thing and the most important thing was that subtle fact that for 6 months we had interacted without me knowing who he was. The reason that's important is because I never had any sort of pretenses to our relationship. I never had any sort of need or ask. I wasn't coming to him pitching a startup. I wasn't asking for a job because I didn't know who he was. So it was pure genuine interest of just talking to another human being. And people in high positions, people like Tim, people like your mentors, they are constantly hit with people asking them for something everyone who comes into their life wants something from them there's always a transaction mm -hmm. and when you can be the opposite of that when you can mm -hmm. seek people out just for their knowledge just to learn from them to absorb by osmosis being around someone like that it stands out in their minds when you can be genuine like that 
So that I think is probably the most important thing. Okay. I told Tim later, I didn't know who you were for the first six months and we kind of had a laugh about it. But it definitely came across that I was genuine and I wasn't looking for something from him in the way that everyone else does. The other thing I would say is there is a discipline and a certain mentality that comes across when I was taking the actions on a daily basis that I was. I was showing up at the gym every single morning at that time. You know certain things about a person that does that. Yeah. You know that I'm the type of person that when when I say I'm going to do something, gonna I'm going to do it. And that tells you a lot about someone. You have these subtle signals that you're sending out into the world on a daily basis through your actions. And whether you know what they are or not, other people are observing them. Certain things you do in whatever way are sure. sending signals about who you are as a person and your identity. So be very thoughtful about what signals you want to be sending the world. Fair. Very fair. That's... But, okay, here was a question on the first thing which you said like just being around people to learn and you know just to just to be around them for to absorb knowledge right i'm sure tim cook or any one of the big shots they would find at least hundreds of people every day who would say this thing to them that i only want to be around you because of the knowledge i only want to be around you because i want to learn from you right what do you think how do they identify who to give time to and who not to. The second thing, which you said, like somebody who shows up every day kind of stuff. I think that's certainly part of it, the signals. And it had been six months before I made any sort of ask. Ah. It had been a long time. So I didn't just show up at the gym at 5 a.m. one morning, see Tim Cook, walk up to him and say, will you be my mentor? Will you get coffee? I'd like to learn from you. Because he has, to your point, thousands of people that probably ask him that exact thing or would do that. It had been so long of building a genuine relationship mm. with someone. We had become friends. We were friends. I didn't know his name. He didn't know my yeah. name, but we were friends. And that speaks volumes because then at that point we had had a relationship. There was a basis for it that wasn't just a transaction that I was coming in to try to have. And with people in those positions, it's just it's hard for them to find real friends, to find real relationships with people that don't want something from them. And to this day... I don't know that I've ever asked him a single question about Apple. I've spent tons okay. of time with him over the years. I've never asked him a single question about things going on at Apple or what, you know, what's going on, what's happening. Partially because I'm so sensitive to the fact that I don't want him to think that I'm looking for something from him. Mm. I want to learn. He has access to the smartest people in the world. I want to know how they think. How was his relationship with so-and-so, someone that I'm interested in learning from? How does he think about goals how does he think about yeah. building how does he think about growth at his age in his life what gives him the energy to wake up every morning and show up at the gym when he's a billionaire yeah. he's a billionaire but he's showing up at the gym at 4 45 in the morning why why would you possibly do that those are the things that i wanted to learn true now that that makes sense that was going to be my next question i wanted to ask like because you've spent so much time with him what do you think is really outstanding about him there are a few things that stand out in my mind about Tim Cook. The first one is the most insane, sickening work ethic that you'll ever find in a human being. And the fact that he's showing up at the gym at 4.45 in the morning every day as a billionaire, as the CEO of the largest company in the world, is insane. Yeah, He's showing up, he's getting to the office before every single junior employee that works for him. And you just know, if you're working with someone like that, that you are not going to outwork the CEO of your company. That is unbelievable, mm. unprecedented. He and works- at, at that age. And at that age, to have done it his whole career. The second one is he is incredibly principled. He has a core set of values and principles. I don't know if he has them written down or if they're just so firmly ingrained in his mind that he operates by. And he sticks to them. And anything that he looks at, any challenging decision, he's viewing through the lens of those set of principles and values. And a lot of us strive for that, but we don't have such a clear picture of what they are so it can be challenging. And that has always pushed me. Learning that about him has always pushed me to try to define what those values are in my life that I want to live by. Because it provides such clarity in chaos when you're able to do that. When you're able to look in a moment of 
craziness where there's noise all around you and just know, just narrow the field of vision to that one thing. He is incredible with that. So the CEO of Apple, Tim Cook, okay. What was the best thing you learned from him? What did he teach you the best, specific to you? Because you say that you've learned a lot from him, right? He's, yeah. he's CEO of Apple. I mean, there are the gazillion things to learn from him. Yeah. What have you learned? The most interesting thing I learned from Tim Cook, the most interesting story, is related to how he found himself at Apple. And it's a lesson for all of us around following our passions and pursuing things that we have genuine excitement about. So Tim was prior to Apple at Compaq, which was a small computer company yeah. that you might remember. Maybe you're too young. I know, I know. <laughs> and prior to that, he had been at IBM and he was on the fast track to be an executive at this big company, incredible career. Everyone's patting you on the back. You know, he was in their like executive acceleration program and he decided to leave that cushy gig to take a role, I believe as COO, at Compaq, this tiny computer startup. And he did it because he had the energy. He was so excited about jumping to that role. Six months after joining Compaq, Steve Jobs was looking for someone to run all their supply chain, to run their operations at Apple, and was looking through the stack of resumes that the recruiters had given him and saw Tim's resume. And he saw that he had been at IBM, which Steve kind of looked down on this big company, slow moving, et cetera. But then he saw, oh, he left and went to Compaq, a small startup, dangerous move, risky move. This guy actually has something to him, he thought. And that was what led to him hiring Tim. That was what drove him to the top of Steve Jobs' list and bringing him in, and now the rest is history as Tim is CEO. And it all sparked from that small decision to follow his energy to go to Compaq, to leave the cushy gig. And when Tim told me that story, I was so blown away by it. And it coincided with my own journey, with thinking about my own life. Was I going to continue to pursue this cushy path or should I jump and do this thing that didn't really make sense yeah. to anyone but me? And what he said about it when he told me this story was that things have a way of working out when you follow your energy. And he never could have predicted that. He yeah. never could have predicted that going to Compaq would have led to Steve Jobs taking his resume so seriously because of that move that he had made. He just did it because that was where his energy was leading him. And what an incredible case study yeah. of that. Wow. Wow. This is, this is your, uh, the fourth one, the fourth luck, mm. right? He was, he was doing things and then somebody spotted that. So exactly. It's, it's wild. I never thought of it this way. I thought he must be some exceptionally crazy man who Steve Jobs must have hunted the way he hunts everyone. It's so sort of crazy. No, and I think Steve would have viewed him very differently if his resume had just said IBM. Mm. He never would have gotten the job. Yeah, yeah. It was because of that small switch. And it's so funny. It's like, you know, Steve Jobs has that famous commencement speech that he gave at Stanford University. And in it, he talked about connecting the dots yeah. and how you have to have faith that the dots will connect in your life. You can't connect them looking forward. You can only connect them in reverse. And for Tim, that's such a true case true. of the dots connecting. You couldn't have possibly known that mm. going to Compaq was going to lead to this. But in hindsight, you can look at it and say that it did. And I had a very interesting uh, insight about Apple. And we can move to the next part after this because it's something it's totally unrelated. But I was reading that Steve Jobs, maybe you've worked with, like you know Tim Cook personally, so probably you would understand and help give me some light on this. So I read an article, I think it was by Allen or somebody, which said that Steve Jobs never prepared for his succession. Have you read it? Mm. Oh, you read it like where he, so he built a design team separately and a supply team separately. He And he was the only one who was the connector between both of them. Mm. And he never made a succession. So nobody knew who's going to be the right person. Like whether it's going to be Johnny Ivey or the, whether it's going to be Tim Cooks, who's going to be the next person. So what do you have to say about it? Do you think that the, the creativity has gone lost in Apple because there's no one who can combine those two things? Because... Tim Cooks is an excellent supply guy. Mm -hmm. Like he's an excellent operations person. He's not a design person. So what are your views on that? Yeah. First off, I think Steve Jobs is a once in a 
generation, multi-generation talent. And I think Tim would be the first to say that. He has so much admiration. And his first thing when he became CEO in every interview you read is him acknowledging, I am not Steve Jobs. True. Nor am I going to attempt to be Steve Jobs because no one can replicate Steve. He was one of a kind. But if Tim has one enormous strength, it's that he knows what he's exceptional at and he knows what he's not. And he's willing to, he doesn't have the ego about those things that he's not. He's willing to outsource those to people who are exceptional at them, to mm. give them the opportunity to be exceptional at those things. And that is what has allowed Apple to, what now, 5, 10x in value since Tim took over. It's that they've been able to continue to achieve on the supply chain side and continue to be extraordinary at that because Tim is so unbelievable on that side. And he's given and armed people with the responsibility to do those other things, to make the advancements from a design standpoint, from a product standpoint. Have they launched you know, their next iPhone, which is what everyone uh, complains about? They haven't had another massive product yeah. release like that? No, but a billion people have Apple products around the world. A billion people have iPhones. True. I mean, when I walk around the street in India and I see someone with an iPhone, we are connected in some yeah. incredible way just through this technology. And that is such an unbelievable thing to me. I think it's hard to, it's almost hard to comprehend the scale of that and the connection that it has. There's two companies in the world, it's Apple and Facebook. There's 2 billion daily active users. Unbelievable how it's connected people. So I think on the succession question in particular, I just think he picked the perfect person in the end because he was someone who knew his strengths and knew his weaknesses mm. and didn't have an ego about his weaknesses. So many yeah. of us have ego about our weaknesses. I do. Yeah. I'm terrible about it. <laughs> I, I have things that I know I'm bad at, and yet I insist on trying to do them. And that makes no sense. What we should all do is figure out what we're great at and focus all our energy on those and yeah. figure out what we're bad at and find people who are great at those things. And how do you find them? Okay, that's. A, do you know anything about like what kind of questions did Steve Jobs ask no. <laughs> to Tim Cook while hiring him? No, like, that I would don't. Be crazy. I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know what senior executive recruiting looks like. Actually, yeah. it's you know because I I know my own recruiting experience when I've gone to jobs and it's like you know they're getting to know you and they're asking you technical questions. But what do you ask to a prospective COO? And you know it's like it's a very different process in general. I I don't have any insight into that unfortunately. Um, but it is interesting. I mean, you, you see someone's track record at that point. You see what they've done. They have, you know, to the point earlier on evidence. You can actually look at their evidence. What, how did things improve under you at these prior experiences that you've had? And and how do you envision things improving for us? Yeah. Show them, you know, the inside gory details of your business and say, what would you do? What are the areas you would improve? It's so difficult, right? Yeah. It's so difficult. It's, it's Imagine that. Imagine yeah. looking at Apple like supply chain and yeah. having to come in and criticize Steve Jobs yeah. and say, hey, this isn't good enough. Here's what I would do to make it better. <laughs> I mean, that takes guts. <laughs> That's to come crazy, in and do that. right? That's insane. I mean, oh today, God. like I think about someone doing that to Elon Musk. You know, like go, come into Tesla and tell me where my supply chain is screwed up. And yeah. you get to sit in a room with Elon Musk and tell him why he sucks at supply chain. Oh, Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, man, that'd be scary. Yeah. That'd be... So the person wow. that makes it through that gauntlet, pretty impressive. And who actually proves that he has a point, not mm -hmm. just... Who actually executes. Yeah, executes. Yeah. Wow. Talking about Elon Musk, right? Mm -hmm. we, we were wanting to talk about it. How, like, have you read about the guy? Have you yeah. understood, like... How does he operate? Like, what is there in him? Okay. There are so many things which fascinates me about him. The first is, how could he build, like, the m biggest, the most valued automobiles company without marketing? Mm. Like, what is that? I want to know that. Like, I'm, I'm in the business of building brands. I'm doing, I'm starting a new, like, whole company about it. I just want to understand that. Like, what do you think? What's the reason? How could he build that? Product first. It was a cult. He built a cult and a community around a product in an unbelievable way. And the way they started Tesla was sort of genius in that they built the Halo product first. They built this expensive, beautiful Roadster, the Tesla Roadster. That was the first car. It was this really sporty, incredible, high performance. And from there, they've gone from the top 
and slowly move to more mass market cars. And what that did was it kind of flipped the traditional auto market on its head. Rather than just producing the cheap car and then having one maybe that's really expensive, they started at the top. So it created this allure, aspiration. aspiration about Tesla. I lived in California the whole time those cars were coming out. In the early days when you'd see a Roadster, you'd say, man, look at that car, unbelievable. And then they released the Model S and it was sporty, but it was a little more accessible. You started seeing more of them on the road. It was still $120,000 expensive, expensive car. And so they were really nice and you saw them and they built from the top down this incredible allure, this incredible aspirational brand that was so different in the auto industry. It had never existed in that way from the from the top down. So you, you feel that starting from the top, building the most premium product and making people want that worked out really well for them. It worked out really well, but hindsight's twenty twenty. Would it work for everybody? I don't know. He did something very, very unique. And I'm speaking as a, I, I have two Teslas. Uh, so so I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of <laughs> their cars. Fan, of course. They're unbelievable. <laughs> the self-driving is incredible. I'm a huge, huge fan of the cars. Um, but it was truly special what they did. I mean, they've spent $0 on marketing. And when you compare that to all of these car players who have spent just billions upon billions of dollars on advertising, they've been able to scale into a massive car company without doing any of that. Exactly. And revolutionize how everyone thinks about electric vehicles. Electric vehicles were not really sexy, yeah. sexy or really a thing until Tesla. Yeah. And now every car company is having to create that. And that is a tremendous positive for our True. world and for the environment. And so people that hate on Elon Musk, he gets a lot of shit, which some of it is deserved. Yeah. He's crazy sometimes. <laughs> He has done a lot of good yeah. in that way, in normalizing electric vehicles. True, true. And I drove Tesla for the first time in LA uh, recently, I think this April, last April. Mm. And uh, so in US, there's a lane system. Mm. Okay, in India, usually people don't, <laughs> they don't know I've the noticed. lane system. <laughs> okay, there's no lane system, right? And like you, wherever you see space, you just go mm. there, right? Like that's, that's the way to drive it here. <laughs> And so in Tesla, there's an option. The moment your your wheel is on like on a different lanes line, it just shows you red, red, red. Mm -hmm. the, the car buzzes, right? I'm sure you mm -hmm. experience it. And while I'm driving, I just start driving. Every time I'm trying to like just go right and it just started buzzing. I was like, what's happening? What's happening? I, for 15 minutes, I thought someone's gonna bump into me. That's why it's, it's buzzing around. <laughs> and then later I got to know, okay, like if my wheel also steps on someone else's lane, the car's auto-correcting me. Mm. I was like, what the hell? I, d I just, it was so difficult for 15 minutes for me to drive. And the second thing was, I didn't know. Okay, so I took that on the car and rent. Yeah. And then I didn't know that you have to like turn, or like you have to open the car from the side. Mm. Right? And for 15 minutes, Couldn't I'm in the middle of the street. <laughs> like, okay. And, like it was so difficult. Like I didn't know how to turn off the car. And I was like, but there's no turn off, turn on. You just on. get out. You just get, you out. Just get out. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm in India right now, obviously. And my wife is back home in New York and she needed something out of my car and she didn't mm. have my key. Mm. And from here, I opened up my app and unlocked the car sitting in my driveway in New York. And she got into it. And that's just so cool. Yeah. But what car can do that? It's unbelievable. It's wow. crazy. I mean, it makes sense. It's just the internet and it's wired in. And But what an amazing, like these simple things that they've done that have just changed how you could think about a car yeah. working are yeah. incredible. Yeah, true. So that's, wow, I'm sure Elon must be happy about this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, if he's listening, I'm a fan of the cars. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but what do you think? You said like, go. and then, so let's talk about Elon Musk doing hundreds of things. Mm. Okay, What I've seen, I've heard a story that where Elon says that go for such bold things that the world thinks it's crazy. That that's the best filter for you to hire people. Because when you say crazy things like I wanna build, I wanna spaceships. I wanna, like, like I wanna build spaceships or I wanna go to Mars. Sorry. Yeah. So I wanna go to Mars and try to do everything there and wanna build build civilization there, right? I wanna do that. When you say that. 
ninety percent of the people are gonna feel that you're you're crazy. You're just <laughs> dumb. You're stupid, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know. The money has got into your head. You're doing stupid things. But the ten percent who feels that oh, there's possibility. These are the people you can hire. Do you believe in this? Like yes. He's- For what he's trying to do on a consistent basis across all of his companies, whether you look at Tesla, whether you look at SpaceX, Neuralink, Solar City. Solar City. I mean, N- Neuralink is like you know robotic brain. I mean, it's insane. Yeah. Um, I think so. You're 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 basically trying to weed out people that aren't big enough, crazy enough thinkers that don't necessarily believe in your vision, which most people won't. And I think part of his strategy has always been overpromise to the moon. You know, to to the to Mars, I suppose. In this case, like create this massive aspiration because if you undershoot that by a little bit it's still an incredible advancement but if you shoot for something that sounds reasonable and then maybe you don't hit it what benefit did that create for other people mm-hmm. you know he, he has been saying these unbelievable massive numbers for tesla over the years that they've consistently missed and yet because of those because of all the talk because of the press that gets done off of all of that the whole industry has had to change and now the oh. same thing is happening with Mars, with SpaceX. He you know, talks about colonizing Mars and going to Mars. Will they do that in our lifetimes? I don't know. But because he's talked about it so much, because he's taken steps with SpaceX to build these rockets that are reusable, the entire space economy has changed and revolutionized as a result of it. It's changed the entire industry. And so I think it's all part of his strategy that you throw these enormous, crazy sounding goals out there. It recruits incredible people that want to go after those kind of things. And if you miss, it's still an amazing outcome. Do you think we like young entrepreneurs should do that? It depends what you're working on. Oh, we'll promise like whatever you're working on, just just go, just, just over promise, like throw these number things out and then start working backwards. I've often said that I want to impact a billion lives during the course of my life. That sounds ridiculous. That's an insane, ridiculous number. No, that's that's achievable. You can do that. I think so. Yeah. I think so. I think it sounds crazy to a lot of people that hear it. Hmm. But I do say things from time to time that my wife will look at me and be like, what you want to do? You know, I'm writing a book right now and I keep saying like, you know, I want to sell, I want to sell a hundred thousand copies week one. And like, you know, the top, the number one New York Times bestseller normally sells like 30,000 copies in the first week. I was like, I'm going to sell 100,000 copies the first week. And she's like, there's no real precedent for that. Like, you know, Prince Harry maybe can do that. But like, who are you? How are you going to do that? And I'm just like, I'm going to manifest it. I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to do it. But if I keep saying that in my mind, and even if I go up short and I do 50,000, that's a great outcome. Yeah. So I think there's levels to it. I'm not going around saying that I'm going to go send us to Mars. I'm not, you know, necessarily working on anything that's that ambitious or incredible yeah. for humanity. Um, but I do think that having these enormous dreams and starting to build and show evidence that you can go and accomplish that is healthy. I mean, I think I, I'm a big believer in manifesting these outcomes that you want to create. So am I. And just being able to see it in your own mind before anyone else can. That's Elon yeah. Musk's biggest trait that has allowed him to be successful is that he believes before anyone else could possibly believe that thing can happen. I think he genuinely believes that it is possible. He just fills people, normal people like you and me, he fills us with so much, so many promises that we all subconsciously want him doing. Mm. And that's one of the biggest reasons. He also has this amazing and unique rationality to the things that he's doing that is so confusing from the outside looking in if you don't dissect it. So I'm gonna break it down. When you talk about going to Mars, Mm -hmm. that's crazy. That sounds ridiculous. That doesn't make any sense. That can't possibly work. Mm -hmm. But break it down. His view is that the value of that happening, of making it to Mars and doing that, colonizing it, is so astronomical for humanity, completely changes the course of humanity that even if there's only a 1% chance that it works, the expected value, the percentage chance times the total value if you do it, is enormous. Yeah. And so he's willing to take the bet because it makes sense to do. There's this famous interaction he had with Charlie Munger, the famous mm. investor, Warren Buffett's yeah. partner, where at some lunch, Charlie Munger basically gave a monologue of all of the reasons that Tesla would fail. 
Hmm. sat and told everyone at the table with Elon Musk sitting there all the reasons Tesla would fail. And Elon Musk famously replied, you know, yes, I actually agree with all of those reasons. I think they're all correct and you're probably right, but it's still worth doing because the outcome, if it works, is so huge for humanity that it's still worth trying. It's still important that we try. So I think he has this very fascinating rationality where the probability of success times the unique value that will be created mm. if they succeed is what he really thinks about. Yeah, that's what that's what I meant, that uh, the, if he wins, the reward is going to be so big mm. for everybody, every individual, that the masses want him to win. That's a huge, that's a, that's a brilliant point you're making, uh, that he, get, he has a unique ability to get people on his side. Yeah, like everybody wants that. him to win. Yeah. Like, Think of it, like no matter, even the things he does for fun, people want him to win. Mm. Like buying Twitter? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your take on that? He bought Twitter for fun? Yeah. Um, <laughs> too early to say. There's clearly been a bunch of changes to Twitter since he came in. I would say not all of them have been good. <laughs> okay. Uh, but things are happening at Twitter, which is a positive relative to the past. They're mm. rolling out new features. There's things that they're making changes around, and I'm all for that. Uh, you were telling me something about the AI. Okay, I have a very, I, I'm I'm confused when it comes to AI because I feel it might kill content creators. It might kill creators. It's or it might help them. I just don't know. For to me right now, it looks more towards the dark side. I really feel that creators are dead because. I mean, if somebody can somebody can write for you, in some if somebody can think on behalf of you, if somebody can come up with better content than you, then what's the point? Mm. That they, in fact, there are going to be times when I think it's already happening that they can speak also, right? So, so what are we going to do? We're dead. Like the companies are just going to use it for their specific agendas. So here's the conversation I was having with one of my friends that so all the fintech startups are going to have their finance channels they'll be using these AI tools to build the finance channel. So finance creators, dead, <laughs> right? Banks and business ecosystem will have business creators. Your, let's say Shopify and everything will have a money, online money making kind of creators, right? Everybody will have their own set of creators and the companies will build it. They'll have their teams running it and then you're done. I think you're misunderestimating the human desire to interact with humans. Okay. I think that's what people are missing here when they're predicting the apocalypse for creators is that I don't want to consume content from computers. I don't want a future that looks like Terminator with Arnold Schwarzenegger and the like big robots running around running my world. I want to connect with a personality. And so when I follow someone and the relationship that you're building with your audience is based on your personality, your face, a real person face-to-face -face interaction that they feel they can connect with on some level beyond just the content. And so I've always thought from the early days of my own creator experience, I need to be building a community. I need to be building a true connection person to person with this audience that I'm building. Because if not, if it's just based on the information that I'm giving, then yes, yeah. AI will replace the information. It can already do that. But if it's based on a human connection, on a feeling of cultural connection, on a feeling of social connection, that goes much deeper than just the information you're giving. Mm. So, but, okay. Here's the thing, right? So if you look at content creators right now, there are two types of creators. One is relationship-based creators. One is topic-based creators, okay? So topic-based creators are essentially only being followed for the next topic they're going to bring in the world, right? And there are many like that, many, okay, information-based creators. I think, uh, I don't know, most of the people we talked about right now, they all were in the same category. And then there is relationship-based creator, with, which are essentially your vloggers, your uh, funny content creators, they who, who make you fall in love with their personality. So you mean to say that the one side of creators, the topic-based creators are going to die? I think it's a very challenging future if you are a purely topic-based creator. I used to be a purely topic-based yeah. creator, so I'm talking to myself here as well. I used to simply, I mean, I started my entire creator career was just writing about topics. It was yeah. writing about business or finance, explaining these things, mental models, frameworks. And what I realized maybe about a year ago 
was that that might go away. And the reason I realized it was because I created a market sort of with these Twitter threads originally that a bunch of people came into. They saw yeah. it working for me. And then there were a hundred people creating the exact same thing I was doing. And yeah. so I looked, at it, I looked at it that way. I didn't think about AI. I just, basically those people that were doing that, copying me, were AI to me. Yeah. I was like, that, that was the AI coming after me. And so what I realized was I have to build a relationship with my audience. And that means communicating with them, engaging with them, responding to things they send me, being really personal, doing things that don't scale, to use the, to use yeah. the Paul Graham phrase. And that was when I started sharing more photos of my family, of myself, mm. of my own journey, of my own struggle, being more vulnerable, doing the things that start to build that connection. Because otherwise, the AI is is coming and True. it's coming for you. All right. The last part of the conversation relationship, which has um, recently I've gotten into it a lot because I, I've realized that relationship... You know, you get better with relationship and you grow when you actively work on it, when you work on yourself. And that's how you grow the relationship, right? So it has been now a really an area of interest which I never looked on. And that's why I've been doing this mm. content of relationship, right? And because I've been in, and knowingly or unknowingly, I've always been a person who, who's, who loves like long-term commitment who's been there. So you would see me, I'm such a mama's boy. I'm such a like dad's boy. I'm just such a great, like I'll always be there for my brother. I'll be there with my girlfriend. Like, you know, everything, I'm just like always there. So unknowingly I was there, but now knowingly consciously I'm making constant efforts to make sure that I'm a better person now. And if I have anger issues, how to solve that? What triggers that? So there's so many things. So I wanted your take on relationship. What do you think? Like what makes a great relationship? So much of life that we perceive from the outside looking in is the glamorous stuff. Hmm. When we see people's lives on Instagram and on these social media channels, what we see is the gorgeous vacations, the perfect photo shoots, all the trips, all the events, all of these amazing things. That's very, very little of life. The vast majority of life is doing nothing. It's literally just moments doing nothing. Okay. Boring. When you find a person who you are happy doing nothing with, that is your person. When I got married, a friend asked me the day before, how did you know that Elizabeth, my wife, was the one? And that was what I said. I said, I'm so happy doing absolutely nothing with this woman. And that is life. Life isn't about those fancy vacations and the honeymoons and the glamorous trips and all those things. It is sitting on the couch and relaxing with the person and doing nothing. And when you're happy doing that, that's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing that you cannot take lightly. Have you said it somewhere? I've heard this before. I might From have, you. I may, I may I have think, tweeted it. No, I think you've said it on Ali Abdal's podcast. Have you? Because I've heard, it, heard you saying something. Maybe because I've said it on... Ali Abdal's or maybe like Harry Stebbings. Somewhere I saw you. I like, might have said that. Yeah, in the past. I, it just it just gives me. It's stuck in my mind. Yeah, it's because it just gives me that feeling that I've heard it and now it's making mm. more sense. Mm. And dude, it's true because there are only few people you can do nothing around. Like nothing, you can do nothing around them, and you still be okay. I mean, I have so many friends who have gone through these relationships where. It was all reliant on doing the fun stuff, yeah. on doing the trips, on doing the fancy dinners out, on doing the events and the cool photos and all that stuff. And as soon as you got them into a setting where there was none of that, the relationship fell apart because it wasn't based on something real. It was based on this extrinsic world of glamour. And that's not what life is. That's really not what life is, especially not after you have a kid. After you have a kid, most of your life becomes that kid and basically doing nothing, cleaning up after them, playing with them, walking, all of those things. So you have to love doing nothing with this person. Wow. I mean, it's part of the whole imperfection of what yeah. love and relationships really are. We have this, we all grew up with movies and you know the Disney movies and all these things that painted this perfect picture of relationships and of love and the handsome, charming prince and the beautiful princess getting married and coming together. And that's not reality. It's just not. We are all 
deeply, deeply flawed in our own ways. Mm -hmm. We all have tremendous amounts of baggage, pain, suffering, things from our past, personality flaws, weird eccentricities. We all have these. And so it's finding someone who will perfectly love your imperfections. That is what is impactful. That is what makes the difference. Okay, there, there are two things about it, okay? The relationship, right? There's one thing that you need to be with someone who, who like, with whom everything's happy, everything's great, everything's just, you know, that person just brings you a sense of comfort, a sense of life in you, okay? And then there's other thing that if you want to be with anyone, it's not a garden. It's not like wonderland. You'll have to go through sacrifices, adjustments, compromises. You have to do a lot of that as well. So do you feel that when you compromise in the relationship, isn't it compromising with the core principle of yourself that you never want to compromise in mm. life? It's an amazing question you ask because I've thought about this recently, very recently, that falling in love and having a great relationship is all about giving up your innate selfishness that you've developed your entire life. Our entire childhood and our entire upbringing, our early career years, we are 100% selfish, whether we believe it or not, because we're looking out for ourselves. We're trying to find our way in the world. We're trying to figure out our routines, grow, learn, do all of these things. It's all for ourself for the most part. Yeah. And in order to build a meaningful relationship, you have to give up that selfishness because you have to make those compromises because you have to find someone who you're willing to give up that selfishness for. Yeah. I'm extremely routine oriented. I'm obsessed with my routines. I'm like the annoying person that does their exact same wake up time, the perfect routine, all of that. Okay. My wife is the only person I've ever met in my whole life who I'm willing to give up my routines for, who I'm willing to when she says, oh, stay in bed wow. so you can talk to Roman, our son, that I do it. No one else in the world, if they said that to me, I would say, shut up. No, I'm not doing that. But for my wife, I'm willing to do that because it's so important to our relationship and to who we are for me to make those changes, to mm. give up that selfishness. And so I think it's a great question to ask yourself is, are you willing to give up your natural selfishness for this person? Yeah. Are you willing to let them in in that way? I saw something you did recently that I loved that I want to ask you about. It was a it was a clip of you talking about um, your girlfriend. I think you know was came home and was venting about something. She was upset and someone had been mean or there was something that had happened at work. And I've run into this exact same situation with my wife where she'll come home from work and be you know, annoyed about what so-and-so did and some project didn't go well, whatever it was. And my disposition, which I think is yours, is to be a fixer. Yeah. I'm like, okay, I'm going to fix this. I'm smart. I'm analyzing the situation. I'm going to give you the answer that you need. Like, hey, you could have looked at it this way or here's how the problem might have been solved a little bit better. And she would get so mad at me. And what you said in your video, which I loved, was that they don't want you to fix it. That's not what they're looking for in this yeah. situation. They just want to know that someone is there with them. Yep. And so I think about that so often that sometimes the most powerful thing you can do in life is just say, I'm with you. Yeah. Because that's what they need. Yeah, that's absolutely what 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 we also need, right? That's, you know, I was having this conversation, I think two days ago with someone that the biggest problem is that men and women are not sane. Right? And the biggest problem is that we think that they're same. You know, that's just so different. It's, we, women are very feeling oriented, emotions oriented. Men are very fixing oriented. They're solutions oriented. They want to fix everything. They want to solution, they want to find solutions to everything, okay? And what happens in these two mindsets, the, the moment you're trying to find solutions and if sometimes you go all in and you want to solve that problem, and sometimes when, and when you know that there's no solution over it, you just completely ignore it. You pick it up, ignore it, let it be. Whereas women, okay, they're very feeling oriented. So they will feel everything. It, whether there's a solution for it or no, they would still want to feel that thing with you. So when you are trying to solve a same thing together, the one person wants to feel it and the other person wants solution. 
So you always have to just think about it that, okay, if there's a problem of her, I need to treat it the way she wants me to treat it. Mm. And if the problem of him, I should treat it the way he needs to be treated and not the other way around. Mm. And the problem is where we feel that, okay, you know, we treat other person the way we feel like we need to be treated. And that's wrong. And that's what I think the world just needs to change that we're not same. And, and, and it's not about men and women. It can be opposites as well. Can, yeah. Men can be the feelers as well. Mm -hmm. and the women can be solution oriented. I'm just saying that in my relationship, it's different. So you just need to feel that the way they are, you need to solve their problem like that, mm. not the way you are. Yeah, you need to give them what they need. It's like the, there was that famous book of the the love languages. What's someone's oh, yeah, love yeah, yeah, language? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to know what your partner's <laughs> love language yeah, is. Yeah. And, you know, I it's taken me years to understand this with my wife and to be able to oh. internalize it. And I've known for years what hers is, it's touch, you know, she needs to just be hugged basically. And like, that's what she wants. Yeah. She needs more affection in that way. I don't experience love that way. So it's weird for me, but I need to do that because that's what she needs. Oh, and yes. when I need a certain type of love, she needs to know that and be able to give it to me in that way. And being able to do that, I mean, over the long run, those tiny little things add up. I saw, I think it was Mel Robbins recently talk about this. She said, People are quiet quitting on relationships, slowly letting a relationship atrophy. It's not the big fight, the big breakup, the big thing. It's those tiny nicks. It's death by thousand cuts hmm. by not doing the thing that your partner needs in one little way. It could be as small as not putting the dish where you know your partner likes you to put the dish away. And you do that over and over again. And every single time you do that, it's a tiny sign of disrespect. And you don't think it's a big deal, but she does. And you're slowly chipping away. You're slowly quitting on that relationship. Wow. I thought it was really powerful. This is powerful. This makes this makes so much sense, you know. And in fact, you know what the bigger problem is? The b bigger problem is sometimes you know that this is this is how your partner needs to be loved, or this is what your this is what is important for your partner, mm. and you still don't do it mm. because if, because that's not important for you. Right. So just knowing that, you know, I, I think to make a great relationship work, you need to work. Mm. You It just doesn't fall into place. It's not like movies or like the way fairy tales and the Disney stuff is coming up. You need to work. You need to work on yourself. You need to work on your communication. You need to work on your partner. You need to work on understanding love language. You need to work on every goddamn thing daily. You need to work on your feelings. Right. It's a lot of work. So when you're ready to work on something more than just yourself, that is the time you can actually get in a relationship. If you feel that, hey, someone else is going to come into your life and then just help you get better with your work, I think it's wrong expectation setting of your, of your relationships. You can never let your own stubbornness, your own ego be more important than what you're trying to build with this person. And it's so easy to let that happen because you want to win some fight. You've decided like I am someone that wins fights, like I win arguments. And if that's what you care about, the relationship's never gonna work because no fight is worth ruining a relationship over. It's okay to fight. It's okay if you get into fights. I've seen you talk about this before. That's okay, you yeah. can fight, but you shouldn't let wanting to win a fight get in the way of your relationship. I, I spoke to, a bunch of 80 and 90 year olds for my birthday, asking them what advice they would give to their younger self. And one of the people that I talked to said, you may win the argument, but if you lose the friend, was it really worth it? And I thought it was so powerful because we get in this like hype mm -hmm. cycle of like, oh, I'm gonna win this argument. We get all pumped up and it's probably yeah. more with men than women. You know, we're like, alpha male, I'm going to win this argument. This is going to be great. But if you lose a friend or if you lose a relationship, what the hell was the point? Yeah. What was the point of that argument? You know, I feel with me specifically, I'll talk about like a subtle problem here, okay? Which I think now I'm overcoming over the time. And it is it's that I never wanted to lose a friend or I never want to lose a partner and not even want to win fight, Okay. But sometimes I feel that, hey, I was right. 
and I'm right. And because I'm right, then other person should listen to me. You know, and that m- used to make things so mm. ugly. And I think I'm still recovering that, mm. where I feel like, oh, this is not my fault at all. Right. So now, so mm-hmm. uh, earlier, like this used to be the baseline, of, and I would just, she was like, that's it, done. You can't understand my point of view. You, you, you're wrong. You're bullshitting. Let's just not talk, okay? So, and I would do that. But now, what I do is, even though let's say I know that the other person's wrong, in my head, let's say I am right. I would say, okay, great, perfect. Let's talk about it tomorrow. Let's talk about ten days later. But the other person, let's say, wants to fix it right here, right now. I would be someone who would accept it. I would let it flow. I would, I would lie about that. Okay, I get your point, and it's okay. Let it be. And then five days later, when the state of anger has gone down, then I would address this and be like, "Hey, you know what? That day you said this. I don't agree to it. Let's fix it." Mm. So that has helped me, you know, strengthen my relationship so much that you don't have to be honest every time on spot. Like you can just sometimes you can not say anything. You can choose not to say anything. Stick it in you. I just hold it for the right time to say it in, so that you can solve it rather than make it more ugly. Because the way you are not ready to accept the truth, the other person is also not ready to accept the truth. Mm. Yeah, wanting to be right and feeling you are right is a dangerous thing. Yeah, I feel that often, and it has led to many fights that could have been avoided. There was an amazing article in the Atlantic, this magazine. I don't know if we have it in India, but in the states, um, that basically was an author saying that. He got a divorce because he wouldn't put his cup in the sink. And that was the headline of the article. And so I clicked in and I was reading it. And it was all about how he would refuse to put his cup in the sink. He would leave it on on the table right next to the sink. And it bothered his wife. And she would say something and... His rational mind would say, no, you're you're absolutely wrong about this thing. It's so stupid. I do so much for this family. I'm earning all this money. I do so many big things. And you're going to get mad at me about this cup that I leave here? You're wrong. And what his point was in the article is that it's not about the cup. He might be correct rationally. It's stupid. It doesn't matter relative to him earning money and relative to him being a good father. It's not about the cup, though. It's about what it meant and what it represented to his wife. What it represented to his wife was that he didn't care enough about her to just do the tiny little action of putting it in the sink, which to her was just so easy and simple. And so every time he did that, he rationalized it in his mind as it's stupid. But for her, it was a subtle sign of disrespect Mm. that chipped away and chipped away and chipped away at their relationship until they broke. Dude, this is so powerful. This is... Wow. It's not about the cup. It's about what it means to the other person. And so what are those Mm. cups in your relationship and in your life? Think about them and try to understand and empathize with what does that cup mean to the other person? Because it doesn't matter what it means to you. It really doesn't. Wow. This is a highlight for me in today's Mm. episode. Dude, this is so good. I'll send you the article. We can put it in the show notes. It's a brilliant article. Yeah, it is. It's it's crazy because, you know, feeling that you're right versus <laughs> wanting to prove that you're right. It's just these are like two different things. They're mm. dangerous. I I don't have I don't have words for it because it is showing me so many like memories right now in my head about my relationship with my brother, my relationship with my mom, my relationship with my girlfriend, my relationship. Oh my God, mm. dude, it's sick. It's everywhere. Yeah, I love it. It's I a great love place it. to end. What do you think are the top three principles which every young person should follow in their lives? It's a great question. I would say the first one would be integrity. You have to operate with high integrity in everything you do. Yeah. Because your career and your life is so long. And one black mark against that, when you start, when you just allow it to slip a little bit, snowballs into something so much bigger. Yeah. It's a very, very slippery slope. True. And, and you know, once you, if it, once you do something, like once you allow something slippery to happen, and if nobody notices, it becomes a habit. 
it becomes so, so much easier to do it the next exactly, time. Exactly, the next time and the next time and the next time. And you don't realize it until it becomes so big and just, 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 just freaks you out. Look at every single one of the worst frauds in history. Hmm. All of them started with a tiny little act, a tiny little slippery slope that got started. Bernie Madoff, one of the biggest frauds in history, billions and billions and billions of dollars. It started with a tiny loss on a bad day that he covered up. And then what? The next time, it's a little bit easier because you've already done yeah. it to cover that next one up and yeah. to say, oh, no, I'll work my way out of this. Don't worry. We'll continue to do better. It'll, it'll be fine. Every time it gets a little bit easier to take that negative action in the direction. And it's the same thing with everything is connected in your life. So when you take actions that are positive in the in the direction of the person you want to be, every single one of those makes it a little bit easier for you to take the next action that's yeah. positive. But it goes both ways. Mm. So if you're taking a negative, if you're not doing the thing you said you were going to do, it gets a little bit easier to not do it the next, next time. time. Yeah. So yeah. you get to decide which course. And the beauty of it is all you need to care about is the next decision. Because if you just start and you make one positive decision, it starts sending you in that direction. Then you make another one. Then you make another one. You start stacking, compounding those positive decisions. It's, I'm thinking, in fact, I feel taking positive steps, every time you take one, it gets difficult, and then difficult, and then difficult. But when it's negative, it gets easier, easier, mm -hmm. and easier. It just works out ever because, so, there was, a, I don't know, I heard it in a Bollywood movie or something somewhere where somebody says that when you do something negative, it feels great instantly. Mm -hmm. When you do something positive, it feels great in the long run. It doesn't feel great instantly. So you need to decide like in long run, even when you like, you know, in long run, do you want to feel great or do you want to feel bad? Like that's the, and it, it just, you know, just clarifies everything in your life because if you think that you're waking up every day and doing anything because you want to have a great life 10 years from now because everybody's working in hope that tomorrow is going to be better, right? Then why are you doing negative things? Because 10 years, ka, like the end point of the 10 years is going to not be really great. It's not going to be something which you wanted. So just just work on something positive because if you are thinking of 10 years, then think of just doing the positive stuff. Long-term thinking is one of the most powerful mindsets you can have as a human being. Naval Ravikant once said, you always should seek to play long-term games with, with long-term long people. people. And it's always stuck in my mind as being so, so true because the people that play long-term games and are able to delay gratification are the people who win, the people that aren't looking for that short-term dopamine hit from scrolling social media or from doing the stupid thing they shouldn't be doing. The people that are willing to delay that gratification, to play that long-term game, will always win. It mm. was Stanford, I think it was at Stanford, there was the marshmallow experiment okay. where they gave a bunch of children a marshmallow and then they left the room and they said, don't eat this marshmallow. We're going to come back and you can eat it when we come back, but you can't eat it now. And they left and they watched the kids that were sitting there with the marshmallows in front of them. Some kids couldn't resist and just ate the marshmallows, this, you know, this sugary yeah, treat right in front of yeah. them. Some kids listened and delayed the gratification. And what they did was the people came back and then said, okay, now you can eat it. They tracked these kids for years into the future. The kids who delayed eating the marshmallow are dramatically more successful as adults than the kids who ate it right away. Unbelievable. Yeah. It plays out over the course of your life. The, the ability to delay that gratification is so impactful in your life. And I don't think it's difficult also. Delay gratification is not that difficult. It depends on who you are. I think for some people it can be really, it, it may not be for you because you're naturally wired in a certain way to be able to do it. If you're wiring, is not built that way, or if you have spent the last 15 years doing the short-term thing and not delaying gratification, it may be hard to flip the switch. Mm. The way to do it, though, is to pat yourself on the back for the tiny wins. Give yourself a little gratification. Yeah. Because if it's not going to be there, like, you know, give an example. Say I'm 300 pounds. I'm, I'm overweight. 
and I want to start working out. And I go to the gym the first day for 20, 30 minutes. It's miserable, terrible. I feel awful, really, really difficult. There's no short-term benefit from that. I didn't, I feel awful. I'm sore the next morning. I don't want to get out of bed. But if I look in the mirror and I say, wow, you, d you did that. You went to the gym. You did the thing you said you were going to do. I give myself a little win to feel good about it. Feel even for five seconds to feel good about what I did. Now I'm more likely to go do it again. Yeah. And so even though the actual gratification of being fit and being in shape and being healthy is maybe a year away of doing that every day or maybe six months away, I'm giving myself a little bit. And it makes me more likely to stay the course, to be able to navigate it. True, true, true. I feel you should also, just like for the fun sake, the moment you go work out, right after you work out, watch yourself naked in front of a mirror. <laughs> because even though like people say that you don't see results in day one, I disagree. You see slight change mm. on day one itself because there's like a small pump, but you can see it, right? Even though your body is not changed significantly, but you could see it. Mm. So, and especially when you're working out in the morning. So delayed gratification, I mean, obviously it works out and you can pat yourself on the back and you can see, but I feel every time you do something good, you something positive, which is gonna benefit you in the long run, it benefits you in short run as well. Mm. And just, I mean, with working out, working out will change your life in every area. Getting into shape, training your body physically on a daily basis, moving your body physically will change everything in your life. Because when you work out, you're much less likely to eat unhealthy as well. Because you don't want to ruin that effort that you just put in. You just put in all this good effort. So people tend to eat healthier once they start working out. People tend to sleep better when they're working out. Sleep impacts your focus the next day when you're working. It all is this virtuous cycle that all starts with just moving your body every single day. If you can just commit to moving your body for 30 minutes every single day in some way, it doesn't even have to be going to the gym, walking, go walk up some stairs, run up and down the street, whatever it might be. Anything. It will change your life. Wow. I'm getting that. <laughs> you been... look great. <laughs> <laughs> no, it has been. So I used to work out a lot, uh, I think three years ago, mm. two years, three years ago. And then I had like a very bad injury mm. on my shoulder. And I, that was like very bad, like I couldn't lift. And then there was this, I got scared that I'm never be able to gonna lift again because my doctor said that I need to undergo a surgery mm. and the surgery will put me on bed for six months. And you know, it was so scary that I was like, let it be. I don't wanna lift again. I'm not doing it. But then now that it's healed, now that I can lift again, obviously I can't do like extreme weights, but I can, I can do, enough that that allow me to get back in shape again. So now there's just a fear. Um, I think that that fear stopped me for two, since like that stopped me for two years, but I'm getting back. So it's a, it has been, I think this is, this is second month where I've not skipped my gym. Amazing. And that's, I feel great. And if not gym, I go play tennis. Yeah. If I like something, some of the other thing I need to do it. And I've, I, I started with, Three days a week. Now I do five days a week, and I'm think I'm good. Mm. And slowly I'll I'll go there with strength. In fact, I, today only just I, I just uploaded a story that hey, I'm looking for a strength coach. Oh good, <laughs> someone. Okay, so first was integrity yeah. for you. Yeah. Second was what was the other principle? Work ethic. Okay. Has to be. I there is this movement of working smart is more important than working hard. Hmm. If you are young. There is no replacement for working hard. I just don't believe it. And the reason I say that is not because I'm some hustle culture bro trying to pedal hard work and work 100 hour weeks. It's literally because early in your career, early in your life, you have to explore the range of opportunities that exist in order to know which are the good ones. The only way to do that is through time. You have to work hard. You have to say yes to opportunities, take on enough things, stumble enough, screw up enough, be embarrassed enough to learn what the good ones are. And then once you've done that, now you can start to work smart, can start to find leverage, can start to exploit the best opportunities that exist. But without that first phase, your view is so narrow that you might be working smart, but on the wrong thing. Yeah. You might climb up this one mountain, get to the top of it, and realize you climbed the wrong one. You get to the top and you look around and say, shit, I climbed the wrong mountain. Now what do I do? I have to go all the way back down. 
And that's a terrible place to be. You don't want to do that. I almost did that. It's not good. Why do you say that you did that? I spent the first seven years of my career working in a traditional finance role. Mm -hmm. That was the wrong mountain for me. I wasn't cut out for it. I didn't want to do it, but the money was great. Yeah. And so I said, this is, this is what success looks like, Sahil. You just should be making more and more money every year. This is success. And I was overweight and I was stressed and I wasn't present with my family. I barely got to see my parents. I didn't see my friends because I was working so much. It was robbing me of all of these other areas of my life because it wasn't suited for who I was as a person. And it was because I hadn't explored broadly enough early in my life. I hadn't, I had just gone into the one thing and thought that was gonna be my life, that was gonna be my career. And fortunately, something happened, a shock to the system with COVID and the lockdowns that led to me having the opportunity to reevaluate and to think more broadly and ultimately led to the decision to quit my job, to start this new journey that I'm on, to move back closer to home, to be closer to my parents. It's benefited my relationship with my wife unbelievably, being more present, being more real, giving my energy, not just my time to her. Everything has changed when you find the right mountain that you want to climb. And that you can only find when you're working really hard on 10 different things. And then then you find out, like when you explore 10 things. Because you have to see it. You have to see the entire map. I don't know if you ever played video games as a yeah. kid, but there were like those video games where you were, you know, in the, you had the tiny circle and yeah. everything is black on the map yeah. and you have to go explore to open up the map to be able to see what's there. Imagine you're that character and you just decide, oh, I'm just going to build my city in this tiny dot that I can currently see. It, imagine thinking that that is going to be the best dot where you can build your city. You don't know. You have no idea if that's a good place or a terrible place. So you need to go do the hard work to explore, to open up your map, to then figure out where should I be building. Interesting. Uh, but, you know, work ethic is usually, so when we talk about work ethic, you, you talk about that showing up every day at the same place at the same time, you know, doing the same thing, having the right kind of... Uh, timetable, schedule, all of these things. Do you feel that is work ethic or just? I feel it's more related to discipline. It's more related to doing the things you say you're going to do. Yeah, I that's don't what think, I was yeah, believing. I don't think it necessarily has to be working 80, 100 hours either. I think what it relates to is that you say you're going to do something and you show up and you do it. Yeah. No matter what it is. And when someone asks you to do something, you do it and you do a good job on it. Yeah. Yep. You don't just go through the motions. There's a lot of young people out there who just go through the motions. They, they think that having a job is their right, mm -hmm. that someone owes them this, that they should be the CEO the first day. And that, it's, it's more of an American culture thing than an Indian culture. I have generally found that in India, the youth population is unbelievably energetic. They want to grow. They're so focused on the future because the future of India is so bright. Yeah. All of these young people that are getting access to the internet that want to learn. In America, there is a culture with the younger generation right now that they deserve this job. That this is something, yeah, you, you owe me this job. And oh, I should actually be making more money than this. And that is going to change yeah. rather painfully. Entitlement is going to change. Yeah, that's, that's true. I, I also believe in the same thing that you should, you should do what needs to be done. And I, I would put it in a better words. It's your action should map the ambition which comes out of your mouth. And that is one, one of the biggest mm -hmm. problems, right? You know, your, your action should map that because most of the people have wild ambitions. They say wilder things and they feel that all of a sudden they deserve it because everybody, because they look at some, some other hero on the internet and they feel that, oh, he's, he or she is the same age. He or she comes from the same background and I should get to the same thing. I have had the same background of the same education, everything. And then they don't see that, okay, that person has been putting hours every day, learning every day, doing things every day, and you're not. The way I would say it is you can't expect people to just believe you. You need to generate evidence. And that's what you should be focused on is just generating evidence. Nice. If you believe you are something, that's great. I, belief is the first 
the first step in all of this. You have to believe that you are capable of being the CEO, that you can be the leader of this team, that you can do those amazing things that you want to do. But it's your responsibility to generate evidence to prove it to everyone else. Nice. Nice. I like that. I love you have like lines for everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's fun. Like it's it just generate evidence. That's just, yeah. it is increase your luck surface area, mm. four types of luck. I'm a frameworks I love, guy. I yeah, love dude, this like stuff. This is, a, yeah. <laughs> this is what I love reading about, thinking about. I mean, this is, um, I have typically thought about how I create the things that I put out into the world. I don't have any answers. I don't know a single answer for you. Like if you come to me and you say, how do I, how do I succeed? How do I do this? How do I do that? I can't give you the answers. I can give you the questions you should be asking. I can give you the structure and the frameworks of how to think about going about it. And then it's up to you to take that, mold it in your own way and figure out what that looks like. Nice. Nice. Anyone that's trying that's to sell you important. answers, uh -huh. I, well, anyone that's trying to sell you answers, I just don't believe in because it's not one size fits all. Me telling you how I succeeded, how does that help you? It's very True. different. You're doing a totally different thing than me. My map is not going to fit your reality. <laughs> so first was integrity, second was work oh. ethic, was the third one. Oh, geez. Now you're testing me. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what would be another one you would add to the list? The principal one? Yeah. Hmm. Now you, you've really spun the game. <laughs> I know. No, well, I'm, I'm struggling to come up with a third on the spot. The principle, right? I think, you know, uh, I feel one, I would say more than principle, I think this should be a practice which people should follow in their life. That is observing, not judging. Mm. You know, it's just something which is very powerful I've started noticing in my life. I feel every successful person who I've met, they're very good observers. They just, and they don't judge. So whether good or bad, you should you should see things as they are and just observe what happened when somebody did something. So for, so I for, love that one. Another way to say it for me would be listen much more than you speak. Hmm. Is that kind of another layer of that? And I think the smartest and best people in the world, the most successful people in the world that I know are all incredible listeners. And they're not seeking to be the loudest voice in the room. True. They're not seeking to have all the answers. They ask the best questions. Yeah. And then they have a bias for action that yeah. allows them to act upon what they learn. Yeah. When you observe, when you listen, and then you have a bias for action to go and do things, the, the results are unbelievable. Yep. The most successful people in the world, that's it. That's the formula. If you wanted to have one, ask great questions and then act. What do you think makes a great podcaster or a great newsletter person? What do you think, What? why is Lex Friedman Lex Friedman or for example, Mr. Beast, Mr. Beast? Like mm. why are great creators great at what they do? What do you think, like is there a similar pattern in every one of them? I think there's an unbelievable consistency and durability to what they do. When you look at any of them, they've been doing it for years. Mr. Beast, how many videos has he put out over the course of his creator career to get to where he is today? Now he has 80 million people watching his videos, every single one that he puts out. But it wasn't like that yeah. when he was starting. He was just creating every single day. And he is maniacal about understanding the algorithm, about thumbnails, about titles. I mean, like truly next level mad scientist about how he thinks about those things. And that stands out everywhere. The best interviewers, Tim Ferriss, I love his podcast. He's an incredible interviewer. Spends hours with an interview coach. He has the interview coach review the transcripts and the videos of his interviews. And that person criticizes him and says, here's where you should have gone deeper. Here's where you could have stayed at the surface. I mean, he takes it like he's a professional athlete. That's how he, tra he trains to be an interviewer. And the best creators are doing that in whatever domain it is. Them. You have to train oh. in the same way that a professional athlete does because this is your sport. If you want to be one of the best podcasters in the world, this is your sport. The last two questions, which is on the more on the career side, mm. I wanted to just make it short. Like what's the one framework which a lot of young entrepreneurs watching this should follow in order to build their career trajectory? I'm sure you must have read like hundreds of framework. Mm. This is a generic question, which I want you to understand. 
Stop comparing yourself to others. Full stop. It is everyone's tendency to base your own happiness on how you compare to those around you. And it is the most dangerous game you can play early in your career. It leads to you creating these unbelievably unnecessary timelines on which you're supposed to achieve things based on how other people have. And all it does is make you feel unhappy about where you are today. The only thing that matters is the comparison of yourself today versus yourself yesterday. And if that is a happy comparison, then that's great. But I have, when I think about my own career and my own life, most of my unhappiness has come from my comparing myself to other people. I didn't get Forbes 30 under 30. I'm congratulating <laughs> you on getting it. I was so mad for so many years about the fact that I didn't get that because I thought that that was what it meant to be successful, that I got Forbes 30 under 30 and I didn't get it. Over and over and over again, I didn't get it. And it made me really unhappy. I saw friends posting on LinkedIn about raising $200 million for their startup or valued at a billion dollars or I got into Harvard Business School or I got this fancy job at Google and I wasn't getting any of those things. And every time I saw it, I felt upset. And I felt upset about where I was in comparison to them. And I think about how much time I wasted and I think about how much energy I wasted doing that. And it was just stupid. It was just bullshit. And then I see people out there that are following that same path as me. And I just want to say, I just want to shake those people out of it. Just as best as you can, stop comparing yourself to others. Stop following other people's timelines. Stop scrolling social media in a way where you're following people who are making you feel bad about yourself. Most people scroll social media and all they're seeing are things that are making them want to be someone else, be somewhere else, be with someone else. All of these negative things, that's not healthy. Don't follow those people. Follow people who inspire you to be better than you are today, who inspire you to grow, to learn, to expand your mind. Don't follow the people that make you feel bad that you don't have their life. You don't need that. That's, that has been the root cause of, for my unhappiness for the longest time. And I still struggle with it today. Yeah, it's 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 a basic thing to say, but it's so difficult to follow. It's so difficult. And I, it's true. I still struggle with it. The last question of the day, which I feel I had to ask you, is I think everybody has asked you this. Which one is your favorite mental model till date? <laughs> <laughs> like Sile Bloom is a man of yeah. mental models and frameworks on Twitter, on internet. Yeah. Like the world knows you from that. You know, I want to compliment you on one thing. There's one thing which uh, one of the uh, Nitin Kamath, if you, the Nikhil Kamath, I tell you, his, his elder brother, Nitin Kamath, he told me this, that, you know, focus on becoming an influencer who influences the influencers, hmm. you know, and that's super powerful because he said, if you become a person who's influencing 100 people who have 100, 100 million reach, you're the most powerful person on that earth instead of you directly reaching out to 100 million, right? So I think with you, that's the case. You really, really have an impact on the top 1% of the people hmm. because people who can consume your content are not someone who is just getting started. They, they have already had to, because you can't, in order for your content to make sense, they need to be doing something. They need mm -hmm. to be some kind of achiever. They need to be some, they need to have some kind of work ethic. They need to have some kind of, uh, some kind of hunger to become better, right? So oh, everybody who's following you, I think they're already an influencer in some or the other way. And that you've done beautifully. So kudos to you on that. that. My favorite <laughs> mental model, I would have to come back to Occam's razor. Okay. You know, this, <laughs> That's the most wise Simple, <laughs> Simple is beautiful. You know, this whole idea that the simplest explanation is often the best one. And the reason I say that that's my favorite is because it is the foundation of everything that I do, which is trying to simplify the complex. I want to take these things that are previously exclusive or challenging to understand and distill them into something that anyone can engage with and learn from. And... If one mental model applies to everything that I do, it's that one. So that that would have to be my favorite just because so, it's at the root. So what of is everything. the whole model? Can you explain it to the audience who are watching it for Yeah, the Occam's time? razor is this idea that when you're faced with a whole ton of potential 
hypotheses about something, the simplest one, the one that requires the fewest assumptions to be true is often the best one. And so the whole idea when you generalize it is just that simple is beautiful. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, yeah. if you will, the famous quote. And I think it's true. And we're all looking for beautiful simplicity, elegance that cuts through all the complexity and noise of life. And so when you can provide that, when you can create content that does that, it's a really, really powerful thing. Because if I go write a 10,000 word newsletter, super complicated, dense, how many people are going to read that and be impacted by it? But if I can go distill those same ideas into something that's 500 words, simple language, like a second grader could read it, now how many people can I impact with that? How many people will be able to digest that and have it impact their life? It's so much more powerful, 100 times more powerful. And so I think it's really true. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Do you, do you read to learn how to make things simple? I, are you a reader? Like you're I read a, a lot. Yeah, read I, a lot? Yeah, I read constantly. Give me top three books like you've read. When Breath Becomes Air is probably the most impactful book I've ever read. Okay. Um, it's about a, it's a true story written by a Stanford neurosurgeon who gets diagnosed with terminal cancer. And during the last year of his life, he writes this book wrestling with the meaning and purpose of life. Extremely, extremely impactful. Um, the Alchemist is another book that I read every single year. Um, manifesting. I mean, this okay, is the yeah. stuff that we've been talking about. Incredible, yeah. incredible. And then if I were to pick a third book, I'm going to pick one that's a little different that I haven't talked about in the past, which is Barbarian Days. It's called Barbarian Days, A Surfing Life. And it is the most random book you will ever hear any business person mention because it has nothing to do with business. It's about surfing and it's a true story. It's written by this guy who goes off and journeys the world surfing at different exclusive spots. But it is such a powerful metaphors for life contained in it of riding the waves of life, of having mm. this mentality of a surfer, of being able to ride a wave, knowing that that wave is going to end and having that faith that there are always going to be more waves in the future. Interesting. Thank you so much for being here, Sahil. I hope you enjoyed as much as we did. Oh, so I got much. so much juice out of you. You're an incredible interviewer. This was a blast. And I'm so happy that we were able to do it in person. Yes, uh, I'm so glad we did it in person, yeah. man. Thanks a lot for doing this, brother. Thank you. Thank you. you.